Tonight, ASCSU has a new president and speaker of the Senate. See how these changes will impact campus. And Turning Point USA brought in Riley Gaines to speak to students at CSU. We have an exclusive interview. Finally, graduation will look different at Colorado State University. Learn how your commencement is changing. All that and more on CTV starting right now. Good evening, I'm Chico Zia Ozor. And I'm Bailey Borkowski. Thank you for joining us tonight. Election results are in for the ASCSU 2024-2025 school year. A new Senate speaker has been elected, and for the first time in 30 years, a student has been re-elected for a second term as president. of the president-vice-president election is the decider. <laughs> Hayden Taylor is the Speaker of the Senate, winning 61% of the vote. Nicholas DeSalvo and Braxton Dietz won the presidential and vice presidential race with 53% of the vote. Voting was down from last year's election. With over 3,400 votes, only 11.2 of CSU's total population voted. Colorado State's long-running graduation ceremonies will start to look very different very soon. Last week, President Amy Parsons announced a new commencement format where all Rams will gather together in Canvas Stadium each spring. This will replace CSU's historic college-based ceremonies. Along with this structure, new departments will still host recognition events for students in specific colleges in the fall and spring semesters. Parsons' letter notes this new format will allow students and families adequate planning time and flexibility. This new format will go into effect starting spring of 2025, whereas the spring and fall 2024 commencements will remain the same. Diana Wall a trailblazing CSU professor and globally recognized scientist, passed away on March 25th at age 80. Wall was recognized around the world for her research in soil biodiversity. Joining CSU in 1993, she became the founding director of the School of Environmental Sustainability. However, her most groundbreaking research took place in Antarctica, re researching soil in the dry valleys. I think that we forget about soil having a lot of life, teeming life in it. And so we treat it poorly. If you go out and you just took a handful of soil, you might have a hundred, of, hundred species of nematodes in there that you didn't know about. If there are any students or faculty in need of support during this time, CSU's Health Network offers well-being and mental health resources. Available at health.colostate.edu. Controversial figure and activist Riley Gaines visited Colorado State University last night to share her perspectives on women's sports. After tying with trans swimmer Leah Thomas at the 2022 Swimming Championships, Riley Gaines has embarked on a countrywide journey to, in her own words, protect women's sports. Again, my message is, is simple. Uh, it's not standing against anything. It's not being anti-anything. My message really is pro-woman. Throughout this process, she has become an incredibly controversial figure who many view as anti-trans. In one particular instance at San Francisco State University, this controversy led to student protests and police intervention. Uh, this is certainly a much warmer welcome than I received in San Francisco, uh, which was my first mistake going to San Francisco. Gaines, however, received a warm welcome by the students in attendance at CSU, in addition to Colorado State Representative Richard Holtorf, who held her in high regard for her efforts to engage with the youth. Now, how many young people are here that are going to college here under the age of 25? Okay, very much like Riley, put your hands down. Very much like Riley, you have a very important role. Because the war is being fought in 
the Generation Z, Generation Y, Generation X demographic. With an audience comprised of CSU students, high school students, and Fort Collins locals, Riley Gaines' presence on CSU's campus certainly had a broad impact on the community. With the sun finally making an appearance this week, let's see if these temperatures will stick around. Weather anchor Elise Gerke has the rundown. Elise? Thanks, GM Bailey. I'm Elise Gerke here to bring you tonight's weather forecast. Currently in Fort Collins, it is 67 degrees. The sun set at 7.29 p.m. and the wind is moving south at 6 miles per hour. Since Tuesday, we've been seeing a trend of warmer, sunnier weather. Some would say the forecast calls for a pool party. But given Colorado's inconsistent weather trends, who knows how long this will last? Wait, I know how long this will last. I'm the weather forecaster. Anyway, moving on to overnight lows, heading down the I-25 corridor, um, Fort Collins will sit at 42 degrees, Denver at 47, and Colorado Springs and Pueblo, more of the same. Heading over to the Eastern Plains, Sterling and Burlington will sit at 41 degrees, Lamone at 34, and Lamar at 39. Over on the western slopes, Craig, and Craig Vale, Gunnison, and Telluride will all sit in the 30 degree range, while Grand Junction will peak at 51 degrees. Tomorrow in Fort Collins, we'll see some sun and some clouds with a high of 74 degrees and a low of 40 degrees. The sun will set at 7.30 p.m. The wind will move southeast at 19 miles per hour. Heading into our five-day forecast, as you can see, um, it will be a little bit windy on Saturday and Sunday. Um, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, the clouds will take over a little bit, but the sun will hopefully shine through with the high being on Wednesday of 62 degrees. It's been seven years since a total solar eclipse. Um, the reporter Gabrielle Hibbitz has the rundown on where to watch this solar eclipse. Gabrielle? Thanks, Elise. On April 8th, 2024, a total solar eclipse will cast a shadow over parts of the United States prompting a mass travel event to the path of totality, which can be found in Texas, Maine, and several states in between. Astronomy professor Emily Hardigree Ullman encourages students to witness this rare event. So the solar eclipses are so rare um, that we try to kind of do an event whenever they mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. um, the lunar eclipses are much more common, and so often when there's a lunar eclipse, we'll open the observatory on campus. While Coloradans will not get to experience the eclipse in full without traveling So the solar eclipses are so rare um, that we try to kind of do an event whenever they mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. um, the lunar eclipses are much more common, and so often when there's a lunar eclipse, we'll open the observatory on campus. While Coloradans will not get to experience the eclipse in full without traveling to another state, we will get to witness part of the action. Fort Collins will experience the eclipse in 63% totality. On April 8th, I'll be out at the LSC during the midday with my solar telescopes. Okay. Um, and then the observatory, we're actually just opening it this Friday um, for our public nights. Those will run April through November. Colorado will have a partial solar eclipse starting around 11.40 in the morning, with a max partial eclipse starting close to 1 in the afternoon in Fort Collins, with roughly 63% totality. The eclipse will end around 1.30 in the afternoon. Definitely, if you have a few minutes to spare during the eclipse, you should come out and see it, because it's not something that you get the opportunity to look at very often. Emily suggests that students purchase eclipse glasses so they can view the eclipse safely from wherever they are. Eclipse glasses can be found at local convenience stores. Don't go away just yet. We have the details on two Fort Collins festivals you do not want to miss. After two years? You ought to be kidding me! 
Okay, okay. No, Robbie! Seriously, do you have anything you can use against the dragon? I can do fireball. That'll do a lot of damage. Yeah, to all of us! Well, I, 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 we're in a four I'm sorry, what else do you want me to do? Oh, I can't oh, say okay, 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 okay. Hold on, hold on. All right. Wizard. 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 You gonna roll? Welcome back from the break. CSU employees may have an easier way to get to campus with a program called Vanpool. Priced at $100 per month, Vanpool is an alternative method of transportation for employees living 15 or more miles away from campus. Providing people the opportunity to save money on personal vehicle costs is one of the benefits as pointed out by an employee from CSU Parking and Transportation Services. For those who are interested, a webinar will be held on April 25th at 1 in the afternoon and can register at pts.colostate.edu slash vanpool general. The month of March may be over, but March Madness is still going strong. Sports anchor Ruby Kayser has the inside scoop on how people's brackets are holding up. Ruby? Thanks, Bailey and Chi. Basketball has consumed my thoughts the past months, so I've decided to see if my classmates on campus felt the same way. This week, I walked around campus to ask Colorado State students about March Madness. Check it out. Hey, Ram fans, it's Ruby Kayser. I'm out here on campus today, and I'm gonna ask some students some questions about March Madness. Let's go. Question about March Madness. Sure. Did you guys make a bracket? No. No? no. Um, do you know when the last time that CSU like how the farthest that they made it in March Madness, like in history is, could you guess? Can I ask you guys a quick question about what's madness? Is it okay with that? Sure. Can you just name a college basketball player? <laughs> Zach Eady. <laughs> Zach Eady. You guys know any? I cannot. None? Oh. Joe Palmer, that's a good one. Oh, right, our own team. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Thanks, guys. Did you make a March Madness bracket this year? Uh, I did. Who broke your bracket? Houston for sure. Yeah, that was a big one. Arizona broke mine. Um, who do you have winning now that they're in the final four? Um, now they're in the final four. I'd want to see NC State win. NC State, that's a good one. Can I ask you guys a question about March Madness? <laughs> okay, can you guys just name a college basketball player really quick? Uh, Joe Palmer. <laughs> good one. Um, McKenna Hashu. Good. Took for a yeah. video. Do you mind? <laughs> okay, I'm just doing a video on March Madness. Um, can you name a college basketball player for me? Oh, uh, Jared. I don't know his last name. He's from. Oh, Jared McKay. <laughs> Yeah, he does that little the song. Yeah, yeah. It's about March Madness. Did you make a bracket this year? No. No? Do you have a prediction of who's gonna win? I think NC State, because I like the big dudes. NC State? Yeah. Okay, in 1969, CSU made it like their farthest run in the tournament. How far do you think they made it? Elite Eight. Yeah, it was the Elite Eight. Good job. Thanks, Anna. Cool. What's your guys' favorite uh, college basketball player right now? Yeah. Have you guys been watching the women at all? Yeah. The women's been pretty good this year. Well, I watched like the big game. Yeah. yeah. LSU or yeah. Iowa? Mm -hmm. Who did you want to win that one? Iowa. Oh, what I mean, how far do you think the British Probably a while ago, like 1970 something. It was 1969. And I'd say the season. They made it one farther. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> March may have ended, but the madness isn't over quite yet. The brackets are down to the final four teams, and there are zero perfect brackets remaining. Make sure to tune in next Tuesday to see how the final games played out now that spring is back in Fort Collins. There are several outdoor festivals to enjoy. 
one of which is going on right now. Reporter Michael Rosalius has more. Michael? Thanks, Ruby. Punk and indie music fans on campus today were in luck. KCSU held their third annual Fools Fest on the Lori Student Sen Center's Sutherland Gardens. I had the opportunity to talk with some attendees about their thoughts and feelings on local music and the Fools Fest. Riley, can you tell me a little bit about Fools Fest and um, you know what it means to you? Yeah, so I'm the local music director of KCSU this year. Um, I'm, I'm a sophomore at CSU, and when I was touring my senior year of high school, so three years ago, three years ago now, the first Fools Fest was happening, and I saw it happening. It was over on the West Lawn, and I that was honestly one of the reasons I decided to come to CSU. I was like, there's a punk festival on campus. This is amazing. I love it. And Fools Fest was a fun and unique showcase of the local talent here in Fort Collins. From the music to the vibes, this event was a great way to compliment a beautiful day. My name is Michael Rosales, reporting from Channel 11, CTV Channel 11, back to you, Chi and Bailey. Thank you, Michael. The 20, sorry. What do you feel about film festivals and music festivals in general? I personally love them. I think they're super fun. What do you think? You know, I actually haven't been to a lot, so I'm a little bit upset that I missed out on this one. It sounded like a it great time. It sounds really fun. Yeah. I love live music. I love listening to music any chance I can get. Yeah. Well, the 2024 ACT Film Festival kicked off Wednesday night. This event showcases award-winning documentaries, allowing audience members to engage with human rights issues from across the globe. Through question and answer sessions, film screenings, communication with other festival goers, celebratory events, and free workshops, ACT hopes to create an inclusive environment for the community. For those who want to check out this event, it is being held at the Lurie Student Center, as well as the Lyric from now until April 7th. Stick around because after the break, we have an in-depth report on navigating wildfire season in Fort Collins. It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes. You can do it here. But you probably won't. You're busy. Kids, work, show coming back in 48 seconds. So let's do this now. Hold up one finger if you're a man. Women, zero. Three more fingers if you're over 60. Two over 50. One over 40. If you're not sure, keep in mind you're sitting on a couch right now. So one more finger if you're not very active. One finger if yes, zero if no. One yes, zero no. Next, find the body type that looks most like you and hold up that many fingers while I look around awkwardly. And that's it. If you're holding up five fingers or more, you probably have prediabetes. Sorry to be so blunt, but hey, you're busy. Just go to the site. Welcome back from the break. I'm Bella Walser. If you are living in Colorado, I am sure you are familiar with wildfires and just how dangerous they can be. The local northern Colorado area has even seen a record-breaking wildfire in recent years, with the Cameron Peak Fire becoming Colorado's third largest individual fire on record in 2020. Wildland fires like Cameron Peak can have lasting impacts, but thankfully, Colorado has several people to help keep our communities safe. Every station at PFA has a specialty, and the specialty at Station 14 is the wildland program. In Java, I was on a hotshot crew, which is um, the kind of fire crews that travel around all the time, and so we were gone from anywhere from 14 to 21 days at a time, um, with only two days off, and then start again. Every firefighter here at PFA is trained in all sorts of different disciplines, from we're all EMTs, we all go through an academy to become structure, firefighters, and then all of us um, take basic classes and we're red-carded wildland firefighters. Um, but it is a physically demanding job where you're working, you're digging in the ground, you're cutting trees um, for up to 16 hours a day. I was able to participate and help out with the High Park Fire, I think maybe back in 2012. And then recently with the Cameron Peak Fire, I think in 2020. I think the High Park Fire and the Cameron Peak Fire may have set 
at, at the time they have set records for the size of the fire. So they, they were a big deal. But the Marshall Fire really highlighted the potential of it um, getting into a neighborhood. Um, that time of year, those, those winds, and it was really dry conditions, um, it got into those neighborhoods and you just couldn't stop it. So now you had grasses that were burning, you had brush that was burning, you had trees that were burning. Well, now it's neighborhoods. You know, the rewarding part about being a wildland firefighter is feeling like you have saved or helped a community. Um, those are pretty exciting, to tell you the truth, to be able to be a part of uh, extinguishing those fires and saving houses in our area. Um, you know, there's really wonderful things about being outside all the time, right? Um, and I, and um, that definitely helps on the mental mental side. Like, even when the job is really hard, you can take a moment and be like, wow, I'm in a really beautiful place. We are on calls. Our lives might depend on each other. If one of us gets in a jam, um, we train on rescuing each other. And so it's very important that we uh, bond with each other. We bond in the academies. We bond with our stations. This is our home away from home. This is a second family. For sure. Putting their lives on the line, wildland firefighters do not have an easy job as they are consistently learning and training. To get a further look into the life of a wildland firefighter, Mike Pottle took me on a tour of the vehicle used for wildland fire calls. This particular rig is specifically set up for wildland fires. This rig has PPE, we call it, personal protective equipment for wildland fires, so it's a little more lightweight. A wildland helmet. This is probably the most important part of our wildland PPE, and that's what we call our web gear. It's got our gloves and our eye protection and our hearing protection, but the most important thing is our fire shelter. The last, a last ditch effort to protect yourself uh, is to deploy a fire shelter here. It's a, a little mini tent that may protect you. The appliances, uh, different nozzles and that kind of thing for the wildland hoses and uh, we use these to actually uh, set fires um, because a lot of times you fight fire with fires. Different diameter hose, depending on the size of the fire and the flames and stuff like that. Some one inch hose, one and a half inch hose. This is the hose that we use to fill up. We have a 300 gallon water tank and so we would use this to fill up our water tank off of a fire hydrant. We would hook up the hoses to these discharges um, and then basically increasing the pressure depending on how much hose they have laid out. So this person right here is the pump operator. And so another effective way to control wildfires is to uh, dig out the grass that's gonna burn until you get down to bare soil. That's what this is, is full of your hand tools. And so we do carry some basic EMS skills, uh, uh, EMS supplies. We have some basic stuff uh, in the event that one of us gets hurt. That's about it. Firefighters are just one of the many people who work to keep people safe from fires. Now today I have with me Marcel McPhail, who is a current firefighter but also a former wildland fire EMT. Mm -hmm. So Marcel, how are you doing today? Tired, but good. Well, good. I'm glad you could come, even though you're tired. <laughs> That's okay. You know what we powered through? We had my morning coffee, got my Wheaties in, we're in. Exactly, exactly. So, I guess just to like dive right into it, um, can you tell me how long you were working as a Wildland EMT? Uh, so, I did it for about two, two and a half, three years. Um, I started when I was 19. Um, I grew up here in Longmont, um, got my EMT when I was in high school, ended up going up to the University of Wyoming. Let's go, folks. Um, and uh, I uh, got into the work uh, at an urgent care who did this in the summers and it was just kind of something that we did. Awesome. Um, and we went out on a bunch of deployments for about yeah, two and a half, three years and got to see Utah, Wyoming, a little bit of Montana, a bunch in Colorado. It was a really, really good time. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so were you around for like any of the bigger northern Colorado fires, like the Cameron Peak fire? Um, so I wasn't on Cameron Peak. I was on mm -hmm. the Mullen fire. Uh, I was burning right around the same time that Cameron Peak was. Um, so when that was going on, 
we uh, ended up sharing a lot of the same resources. So I ran into a bunch of guys who were either fighting the Cameron Peak Fire or just got off, and they were coming up to the Mullen Fire. Um, then I went to the Grizzly Creek Fire. That was a few years ago, and yeah. shut down I-70, which was a pretty big deal at the time. Um, well, yeah. Outside of that, a bunch of smaller fires in and around Wyoming, out in Utah. Um, so some you have heard, and some you have. Yeah. No, that's crazy. Yeah. So did you have, like, when you were working those fires, did you see any interesting things, or do you have any interesting stories from your time there? Oh, absolutely. It's always it's always an interesting time. Um, but I had I think some of my best memories were easily like um, at the end of my uh, Cameron Peak fire. I was working with like an all Spanish speaking crew. Um, they, their crew boss uh, did translate for us, but it was a very unique experience that I've never really gotten to replicate anywhere else. Um, but at the end of that fire, uh, I met one of the crew members who's like six foot seven, forty, like forty years old, and could out hike me in like my prime condition. <laughs> like, dude was just could take off. Um, but we ended up trading a mat for a cigarette and smoking it at the top go. of a mountain at one a.m. and just getting <laughs> a look at the stars. And that was easily one of my favorite moments. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So I mean, I, I know you're surrounded by like fires mm -hmm. a lot, but were you? Did you get to like see any? like cool views or were you in like really any any beautiful places I guess? Oh absolutely. I took it as like my opportunity to scope out camping there and fishing spots and that's exactly what I did. Um, I think my favorite one, it was like uh, this like small little fire out on like the Wyoming uh, Utah border south of like Rock River. Okay. This beautiful little spot like there are a bunch of just like red canyons all around um, and I got to just take in the views for two weeks at a time and then didn't have to treat anybody, thankfully. My job, like, hopefully, is boring, um, especially when they hire us out there. Um, but easily, that was probably the, the most beautiful. It was, like, right in, like, early early spring. Um, so it was just, like, green all around. That's good. good you get to see some positives in it, so okay. that's awesome. So I guess, like, also now that you are a firefighter, um, do you feel like your time, like, in Wildland EMT, mm -hmm. do you feel like you learned any skills that you were able to kind of translate over to what you do today? Oh, absolutely. I think it like gave me like a, a good step in the right direction. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, um, especially as a brand new EMT and kind of figuring out if I wanted to go to med school or be a nurse or anything like that. I really found my passion in doing this. Yeah. Um, and I enjoyed the, the physical aspect of it. I enjoyed the, not always, but enjoyed the hiking and the, like the monotonous work sometimes, mm -hmm. but um, gave me a lot of really good connections with uh, people that I would use down the road uh, who would give me great letters of recommendation and people who ended up becoming lieutenants and captains at other departments. Um, it showed me a different side of what this work could be, um, and it paid me incredibly well to do it. So I am incredibly thankful I had the opportunity to do it. Plus, That's like awesome. getting paid an insane amount of money to go camp and then hopefully not treat <laughs> anybody. It's a pretty good deal. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Marcel, mm, for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and sit with us. I know you're tired. <laughs> but unfortunately, that is all the news we have for you tonight. Make sure to tune into our sports show next Tuesday. We'll see you then. <laughs> okay. Slay. Slay. <laughs> You're great.